On behalf of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II and her loyal subjects, we bring to you the students of Georgetown Day School, British Political History, condensed. The Uniting of the United Kingdom. The British Isles are 3,000 miles east of America. You'll find them happily floating in the Atlantic, a safe distance of 21 miles from France. The making of the modern British state can be traced all the way back to 1066. Back then, the axis of evil was the Normans, oh the that. Normans, and of course, the Normans. Oh Take that. The leader of the Normans and chief bad guy was William of Normandy. He invaded Britain in 1066, conquered everything in sight, and imposed his rule throughout the Isles. As the centuries passed, the descendants of Wicked Willie took diplomatic steps to unite all parts of the British Isles into one nation. As a result, in the 16th century, various acts of union led to us English people being stuck permanently with the Welsh. In the 18th century, we got stuck permanently with the Scots. And in the 19th century, we also got stuck with the Irish. But as the Irish turned out to be a bit of a problem, we didn't want to be stuck with them permanently. So in 1922, we got rid of most of Ireland and just kept the most northern six counties, in other words, Northern Ireland, to ourselves. So that's how we became us, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, the land of the English, Welsh, Scots and Irish, or some of the Irish anyway. From Magna Carta to Emily Pankhurst. Britain is a parliamentary democracy, and the roots of our parliamentary democracy go all the way back to Magna Carta. Now, it's widely believed that Magna Carta was a distant relative of American President Jimmy Carter. Not true. The Magna Carta was an English charter issued in 1215. For the first time ever, it gave rights to feudal landowners <laughs> and curtailed the power of the monarchy. In the centuries that followed, the landowners gradually secured more and more rights for themselves, including the right to vote. <laughs> and they formed a lawmaking body called Parliament. In 1832, the Reform Act expanded voting rights to include not just the landowners, but also some of the middle class. That left one group of individuals still totally disenfranchised, and you guessed it, that was women. Women should be allowed to vote. Women should be allowed to vote. But thanks to the efforts of the first ever women's liber in history, the one and only Emily Pankhurst, women were finally given the vote in 1928. Brits will always remember Magna Carta and Emily Pankhurst. They helped to define modern British democracy. Government of the people, for the people, by the people, British style. In Britain, our government is called Her Majesty's government. But the truth of the matter is, it's not Her Majesty's government at all. In fact, the poor woman doesn't have a say in anything. My husband and I like to wish the British people a... <coughs> to understand how British government actually works, you have to understand how our parliament works. There are two houses of parliament. There's the upper house, which is called the House of Lords. No need to worry about that. It's full of boring old farts who inherited or were appointed to their positions in the Lords, like Mrs Thatcher's son Mark, for example. That's why the Lords have little say in anything whatsoever. The real power in Britain lies in the lower house, which is known as the House of Commons. There are 650 members of the House of Commons, otherwise known as MPs, and they're elected by the British people. Elections are held at a maximum of every five years. And come election day, Britons in 646 areas of the country go to vote for their favourite political person. So who are the main political parties? Um... Well, there's the Conservative Party. They're a little right wing. There's the Liberal Democrat Party. They're a bit more left wing than the Conservatives. And then there's the Labour Party. They're a bit more left wing than the Liberal Democrat Party. 
After election day, the leader of the party with the biggest number of elected MPs becomes the Prime Minister. He puts his cabinet together and he and they start to govern. It's as simple as that. Great Britons, the political ones anyway. There have been many Great Britons over the years, but there are three that any self-respecting comparative politics student should know about. First, there's Winston Churchill. He became British Prime Minister in 1940 and was one of the most inspirational leaders in history. Churchill is famous for his two-finger victory salute after the end of the Second World War. And also for actually giving the two-finger salute to Hitler and Mussolini during the war. Unfortunately, the British public gave Churchill their own two-finger salute by voting him and his Conservative Party out of office in 1945. Next, there's Margaret Thatcher. She became the first ever woman Prime Minister and won three consecutive elections in 1979, in 1983 and in 1987. Margaret Thatcher is most famous in Britain for reducing the role of government in the lives of people, selling off and privatising many of Britain's state-owned assets and encouraging business. Outside Britain, Mrs Thatcher was known for her tough stance on foreign policy, hence her nickname of the Iron Lady, and for cuddling up to American President Ronald Reagan at every opportunity. And finally, there's Tony Blair. Tony Blair became Prime Minister in 1997, and apart from his bad British teeth, will be remembered for two things. Firstly, he created New Labour, a party and a government that would maintain the British welfare state, but would also encourage and promote business. And secondly, he cuddled up to American President George Bush at every opportunity, including over the Iraq war. Cucums. As Britons love animals, it won't surprise you to know that Winston Churchill was known as the British Bulldog. Margaret Thatcher was known as Attila the Hen. And Tony Blair was and is known as George Bush's Poodle. British government in terms of Georgetown Day School. Finally, just to underscore your understanding of British politics, here's how British government relates to that other venerable institution, Georgetown Day School. Here at GDS, our Prime Minister is Peter Branch. He runs the place. Chancellor of the Exchequer is Kate Lindsay. She controls the money. Our Home Secretary is Kevin Barr. He runs home affairs at the high school. Foreign Secretary is Barbara Bergman. She controls all our foreign and therefore college relations. Secretary of Defence is Elaine Scott. She protects GDS from any student who really shouldn't be here. And as for the Queen, well, that's Sue Eikenbury. She's GDS through and through, a great ambassador for the school, but she has absolutely no say in anything whatsoever. On behalf of Her Majesty, Queen Elizabeth II and her loyal subjects, we thank you for watching and God save anyone who has to sit the AP Comparative Politics exam.